So I've just put up here a little section before we get started on the batch data uh, about the presentations. What I'm expecting is a fairly short talk, 12 minutes of slides, plus or minus two, three minutes, and then the rest of questions. We, we pretty much have to stick to a, a schedule of 20 minutes per person because of the putting everyone in. It's a fairly big class, so we're splitting it over two days. And I put the splits over there. Um, and the reason why I've chosen those splits is because we're grouping similar topics together. So for those of you that are choosing sort of the Kaggle website, uh, binary classification topics, you'll probably be all grouped on the same day. People with batch topics are on the same day. And then um, those that are really can find a cluster, you can kind of split on either day. So I, pr uh, I probably won't change the dates around unless you, if it's really serious, you can't make it. Day, but otherwise I'm pretty much sticking to this uh, division there. Um, what I'm expecting is you to set the, tell the whole class really what your data set is about, particularly not so much what is the data, most of us will, uh, will understand that quite easily, but I want you to clearly state your objectives and then why you need to do the following steps. Once you've got your objectives clearly stated, it's usually very apparent why your, your pre-processing is the way it is and why you've chosen a certain type of model, PLS, PCA. And though you're certainly welcome to try other latent variable models as well as other models like neural networks, least squares, support vector machines. Don't feel you're constrained to just PCA or PLS. You're welcome to combine those with other models, but there should be an aspect of PCA and PLS in your, in your talk because of course that's what this course is about. Uh, talk a bit about what you, did you learn from your model and how you achieved the objective. Now, this is not the final uh, way I'm going to grade uh, or look, grade you, nor is it I'm not expecting you to have completely finished your project because the final hand is uh, early January, subject to change. I haven't got a confirmed date yet from Kathy when the graduate student dates have to be due by, but I will typically go back uh, three or four days prior to that due date because that's how long it will take to grade all the reports. And so it's usually pretty generous. It's like sometime in January that uh, you'll have your report. So obviously, talking in, September, in December about work that's only due in January, you may not have finished everything, and that's exactly what this presentation is about. It's sort of like a gate uh, or a checkpoint, as it were, just to see that you're making some progress towards what's coming. And that's what the questions will be about. I will randomly have other people in the class ask you questions, so I will assign you randomly ask someone in the class to ask a question to the person who's just presented. You will have to ask them a question, particularly an open-ended question, like what do you think about doing such and such? Why not consider this type of pre-processing? So it needs to be a relevant question that spurs the person who's presenting to think about something else that they could try in the remaining two, three weeks before their project is due. Okay, so the questions are a chance for the rest of the class to give you input on what they might think of different things they would have tried if they were the ones doing that project. Okay, so that's how we're going to run those two sessions. Um, and I will ask that the people presenting on the 9th of December email me your slides in PDF on the 8th of December. Similarly, people on the 16th presenting uh, your slides in PDF the day before as well, just so I can assemble them all on my computer. If you make minor tweaks to them, um, I may or may not be able to fit them in, but I, I would like a day at least just to read through your slides and prepare some questions for myself and some comments and feedback for you that I will send either by email or I will ask it as a question in the class myself. Um, and also just to get the slides back to back so we can run the class and pretty much finish up in three hours because it's a very tight running framework there with breaks as well. Okay, any questions on that? Um, so let's move on to today's topic, batch systems. Now, this is a really exciting topic from my personal interest. I enjoy this area, but also because of the variety of ways you can apply this topic of batch data analysis to many systems, not just classical batch reactors that are from chemical engineering. I'll talk a bit about the end, how these topics of batch data analysis can be applied to web data, can be applied to humans in terms of our evolution in time, um, during my lifetime and other applications of where batch data analysis, this principle that we're going to see in the class today, can be used. 
But where it's classically applied is uh, in the area of polymer manufacturing. That's, that's usually in a batch type process. And in today's class, we'll look at two case studies which come from the polymer industry. Foods are produced um, in batches. At home, you produce your food in a batch batch-wise manner as well. You add your initial conditions, your ingredients, there's a period of mixing, there's a cooking, and that follows a certain recipe or sequence, and then there's the final product that you produce. But bulk manufacturing of food follows a similar procedure. Um, again, just on a much, much larger scale than you do at home. Fine chemicals is a very, very typical um, batch process <coughs> because they uh, created in such small quantities, these very, very expensive specialty chemicals created in small quantities, often just even in a lab scale in the company, because a little bit of these chemicals goes a long way. Especially, this is also true in the pharmaceutical industry. We make very highly concentrated form of API, or the, the active ingredient in the drug, and then that's distributed in milligram quantities in a tablet that weighs a couple of grams. So that big tablet you're taking is mostly 99% filler. There's a very small amount of active ingredient in that tablet. Uh, so pharmaceutical drugs are produced in batch-wise manner. The raw material, that API that I just spoke about, but also when we actually produce the drugs um, and mix them up, those are done in batches. Biological drugs or um, fermentation type applications, yeast fermentation. These are cellular cultures that are charged to a batch and any of you who've taken the bioprocessing street at the university or at other universities, those are a classical batch reactor. We charge the, charge the fermentation uh, tank with, with active uh, bacterial culture and then those grow over time and we profile the trajectories of their growth over time. Semiconductor industry, and uh, machining of tools, this is an interesting one. Um, here in mechanical engineering, where they machine tools and parts, those are done in a, in a batch-wise sequence. So you start one tool, you do a certain trajectory or pattern on the tool, and that finishes that, that, that tool up, and then you repeat to the next one. So any, basically any process where there's some sort of cycle, where there's a beginning and an end, and there's a period of change in the middle, that's a batch. Okay? And it doesn't have to be a chemical engineering process. Um, let me actually, while we're here, so that you've got it in your head for when we get to the end of the class, um, let me just go all the way down to the end of your notes here. Basically, the reason why, I, this is the, the last slide in the notes, why I want to cover this is that I want you to keep this in mind for those of you that are dealing with these sorts of systems, like where the data? That's, that is a batch. There's an annual cycle from beginning to end. You can start it in January and end it in December, or you can start it from May to May to April. It doesn't matter where you choose your beginning and end, but there's a cycle that goes. Uh, in marketing, we know that sales peak around Christmas time and Halloween and Valentine's Day. Those are peak points in the, in the, in the trajectory of the annual cycle for sales. Uh, if you're manufacturing a product like those tool and die applications, fermentation, I just spoke about. But here's the other one that's actually quite interesting. If you if say if you were monitoring people's sleeping patterns, uh, that's a batch. Like you go to bed and you wake up, and there's a different duration for different people, and you go through a cycle as you sleep, your brain certainly does. Pregnancy is a classical batch. There's some initial conditions that take place, and, and it evolves in nine months later. <laughs> okay, so there's a batch process right there. If you're wanting to model that and track the evolution of that, that would be a good process to, to, to look at. And in fact, the entire human life cycle, from birth to puberty to adolescence, uh, growing up and then menopause and then at the, the end of one's life, that's, that's a batch, right? So our body, we put food in and it goes through our, our stomach, gets processed in a certain way and comes out, it's a batch. Uh, so once you start looking at these topics of batch day analysis, <laughs> You kind of get carried away with the way you can apply this to. Right? So, uh, let's so let's take a look at some of these interesting applications. When we talk about batch systems in today's class, we will consider the classical chemical engineering approach to batch data, where we have a reactor and we usually charge some initial material to it. So a certain initial quantity of raw materials, one or two or three different raw materials are added manually to this reactor to a certain level. 
that's called our initial conditions. And we'll actually come back, we will ignore the initial conditions in today's class, but we will talk about them in the next class when we talk about multi-block methods. But, so just bear that in mind. Once we start the batch, which is often indicated by the time we first turn on the impeller, um, but it may not necessarily be that, it could be some other way that indicates the start of the batch. We let it progress with time, and there's certain trajectories that are followed. So we may tell the, uh, the system here in an automatic way to turn the impeller on and mix for 10 minutes. And that will be the first stage of the batch, or the first phase of the batch. So we'll use that terminology of phases. So that might be the first phase. The second phase might be something like turn on feed A for five minutes at three liters per minute. The, set, the third phase might be then to add feed B. And then the, as feed B is starting to be react, uh, added, it starts to react with feed A as well as the other materials we added initially. And maybe that reaction is exothermic, so we will, will require cooling, which then takes place through a jacket. And that cooling profile might be instrumented as a PID loop. So the PID loop is just told to maintain the jacket temperature uh, to a certain level so that in cascade form, the inner contents of the, jack, uh, of the reactor are held at a, at a fixed temperature. That may proceed for another amount of time, say 30 minutes, or it might proceed not necessarily on a time base, but it might proceed um, so that a certain amount of reaction occurs or that a certain temperature is reached or some other trigger point might come up that signals the end of that phase. And if that's the last phase of the system, then we discharge the material to the downstream unit, which might be packaging, or it might be a secondary batch process, or it might be some other follow-up step. But basically, we've got a start point where the reactor's turned on in the very first phase, right till the end where we discharge the material. And that complete duration of time is called a batch. And in that batch, there can be one, two, or three, or several phases. If, they are, if there's just one phase, the whole phase is the whole batch. But usually we'll find in batch processes that we've got multi-phases. Um, and those, each phase has a different profile. There's something unique about each phase. Now, as that batch is progressing, we'll measure the variables, which we'll call tags or variables. We'll measure those with time. We may choose a sampling rate, say once per minute, once per five minutes, whatever is sufficient for us to track the change of those variables with time. And we'll record those tags with changing with time throughout the duration of the batch. So in this particular example, we'll record the flow rates, temperature, pressure, the impeller speed, the impeller current. Those are, those are the five or six common variables that we often measure in batches. Because they're liquids and solids, uh, sometimes gas-based systems, we'll measure these sort of easy-to-use variables. More and more complex systems will add near-infrared probes and acoustic measurements to them, but for the most part, the data we will come across in the chemical industry is flow rates, temperatures, pressures. Uh, and those are measured over time for each one of those variables. Now, in order to get those batch systems very well controlled and following those recipes exactly as they, they need to be followed, there's a, a, a whole additional layer of instrumentation added to that. So that's not really, really part of this class, but there's a whole lot of cascade control loops around this batch reactor to maintain those trajectories. So some of those trajectories are set by the, the companies. The company decides we want to ramp the temperature up at two degrees per minute for, for 10 minutes. That request made by the company, that trajectory request is implemented by these lower level control loops. And the higher level control loops will, will, will try to maintain those trajectories. Okay. So there's, there's often a very complicated set of uh, control systems around these batch units, and, but they're mainly for, for obtaining that sequencing for traje trajectory control. Okay. They're not used for optimum, for optimizing those sorts of higher level control loops we find more in continuous process. In batch process, these control loops are more for um, just trajectory tracking. So here's a, here's a case uh, for a particular batch system which we'll talk about later today. 
There's three stages. The first stage is 175 minutes. The next stage is about uh, uh, 75 minutes. And the final stage is an additional 75 minutes. And so here's some of the trajectories, four, four trajectories I'm showing here. Uh, there's 10 in this particular case study, but I'm just showing four here because they, they make the graph that is cluttered. So there's the tank level that rises slowly in the first phase. The second phase remains constant as well in the third phase. There's the agitator speed, which is initially just static here, 8 RPM. And that's exactly what triggers phase one going to phase two, is that phase one ends the moment this agitator speed jumps up to 30, R, 30 RPM. And then that stays roughly constant for most of the second phase. But there is a point at which it drops down to a lower speed, and then right at the end, it goes right back up again in the third phase. There's the drier temperature set point and the drier temperature itself um, that uh, change. So the drier temperature set point is this curve up here, and the drier temperature is this dashed line. And that, that changes as well from one phase to the next. Okay? And the key the key distinguishing factor about batch systems compared to continuous systems is that the relationships between the variables, in this case I've shown four variables, the relationships between those four variables is changing with time. In a continuous system, the correlation between the variables remains constant over time. In a batch system, that correlation between the variables changes as the batch progresses from one phase to the next might even change within a phase, but usually we are intentionally changing the correlation between the variables from one phase to the next. In a continuous process, when you take data from a continuous process and you build a PCA model on however many observations you choose, whether it's data from 2003, 4, 5, or all put together, you usually see the same correlation between the variables over time because that's the system operates in one particular way 24-7. In a batch process, we're breaking and changing that correlation structure with time because of the recipe. Because the recipe calls for different changes, it calls for ramping up uh, the collector level by uh, evaporating some solvents. We change the relationship between this variable and that variable in the next phase. Here, they're pretty much constant, but then in the next phase, this one is constant and, and then it drops, so it switches around. The correlation between this variable is rising, and here it's static. And, but in this phase, both are flat lines. Whereas in this second phase, this one is rising, and this one's a flat line. So there's a very different correlation structure in the second phase to the first phase. Okay, so that, to me, is the most important part of understanding the material in today's class comes from this point. The fact that the relationships do not stay fixed over time. <laughs> So let's introduce some terminology that we're going to use. The number of batches in our data matrix is N. The number of variables that we measure, we'll call K. And we measure those variables over a particular time step. And however many time steps you've chosen, that obviously depends on your sampling rate, we'll call that uh, J. And we'll assemble our data in, in a multi-way cube where the top to bottom direction is the number of batches. <coughs> and for each batch, let's just take that first row in that matrix X. So kind of see it going back into the board. That slice of data going back into the board is that all the data for a single batch, it's the data for the K tags over the J time steps. So the first layer going in is the, is the first batch. The second layer is the second batch up to capital N batches. Okay, so this is a multi-way data set in the same way we saw for image data. Yeah. So in the top um, like row, right there, there was one batch. Like, if it was one batch, would that be kind of the same? Oh, I don't know. Oh, okay. Like, the top. The top slice. The top, yeah. yeah. Um, if you, if it wasn't batch data, would that be like your data set? Okay, well, for this, we're just talking about just the batch data. Oh. If, we, if we've got initial conditions or other, other non-batch data, we'll, we'll deal with that in, in, in the next class, where, and then we'll have multiple blocks of data. But in today's class, I'm primarily focusing purely on those trajectories that change over time. So in other words, 
this is, let's say our, our system had four variables, one, two, three, four, capital K is four in this case. These would be the four trajectories over time for one batch. Okay, so I've got these four variables changing with time for this one batch. Those four variables recorded would be the top slice going in there. So column, uh, sorry, this first row, uh, column going back into the board, that would be trajectory one, two, three, and four for one batch. Then I would have a totally different looking diagram for the second batch. So the, the trajectories for the second batch won't look identical to this. They'll look slightly different or very different perhaps. <coughs> and they will form the second slice going back into the page. There's a clear illustration coming up further down to that. This is the typical way we, we assemble these batch data. Just a little bit on, uh, this is more for those of you that are actually dealing with batch data, how we set these up in our computer systems. Or if you're working in a company later on that's dealing with batch data, this is how you will likely uh, deal with it. When you go to the databases in these companies and you ask for the data from all the past few batches, you usually get a spreadsheet where the data from one batch is in one tab, the second tab contains the next batch, and so the structure, let's just take one of these tabs in that spreadsheet, is usually to put uh, the variables in this direction. So capital K columns in each one of these tabs in the spreadsheet. And then going from top to bottom, you've got your time. So one, one sheet here will be the data from one batch, the second batch, third batch, up to capital N batches in your spreadsheet. The other way that you sometimes get it is you get all your data in one massive spreadsheet. So, um, oh sorry, in this particular case, let, I jumped ahead a little bit. Here we, we might get one data file per, um, per batch, in which case we'll have n such CSV files or XLS files. The third way we get data is um, stacked, like shown here. So we just get one long matrix of data and the data for batch one is the first couple of rows, the next few rows are from batch two, and then the last rows are from batch A. And they correspond to variables one, two, three, up to capital K. So for example, this first slice going back into the page here would be all that data from batch one, the second slice from batch two, and the last slice from batch A. And then in order to help you out, there's often added a, a column at the front that tells you the batch number, or it might be a code that your company uses to identify that batch uniquely. In this case, I've used one, two, and so on, but it might be something cryptic like these numbers shown here, 317655, or A, B, F, G, some, some sort of characters or, or numbers that identify that those rows belong to batch one, these next rows belong to batch two. Otherwise, you can't really tell by looking at the spreadsheet where is the data for which batch. And the software requires this as well. So the software certainly doesn't know how many, uh, where, where the rows begin and end for each batch. Yeah. Does it have to be a bit of duration? Okay, so the next one is nine times out of ten it's not of equal duration. Okay, so I've shown you the ideal case which is what we'll deal with in today's class. We'll talk about it at the end about how to get data into this form. But nine times out of 10, the data we deal with have this sort of setup, where every batch is run slightly longer or shorter than the other. And sometimes it's not slightly longer, sometimes it's very much longer, very much shorter, okay? So here batch one is a much longer batch than batch two, so obviously batch one has more rows in our spreadsheet than the data corresponding to batch two. So in this case, you definitely need the identifier to tell you where batch one, two, three, and so on begin and end. In this first case, you can sometimes get away with it if you know ahead of time that each batch corresponds to, say, 300 rows. But in this particular instance, you definitely need that. Yeah. If you do a Fourier transform, wouldn't they all get better with the duration since you're dealing with the time? There are many, many ways to align the data, and we'll talk about that at the oh. end. I've not heard of using Fourier transforms, uh, but that's not, I, not an area I understand very well, so it may well work. But I, 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 maybe on things like spectral data or other data, it may work very well. But I, I, let's talk about it afterwards. I, I certainly don't know too much about Fourier transforms to answer that question correctly. But 
we will talk about at the end about five different ways of aligning data. So that may well be a different additional way one can do it. Okay, so like uh, like the guys pointed out there and, and here, the time dimension is very unequal for most systems, but we'll, we'll talk about this concept of aligning the data later on. Okay, so very quickly here, if I had to superimpose the data for all my batches, I would get plots that look something like this. So here's one particular variable, reactor weight. So this company measures the weight of the reactor over time, and I've superimposed one line comes from one batch. The next line comes from the second batch. And in this case, I think there's about 30 odd batches in the data set, so we get 30 odd trajectories over time for one variable, reactor weight. Another 30 trajectories for the bulk temperature in the reactor over time. Okay, so it's always over time based. Now, this is for the case where the data are not aligned. If the data are aligned, those plots look similar, but they're actually a, they're much more consistent. So the way you can easily spot unaligned data is this ragged end here. But for aligned data, they're all perfectly beginning and ending, and usually we see the same feature overlapping. So in here, we can see that there's some transition where the reactor is empty, stabilized for a period of time, and then is empty further still. But we see that that point in time that that happens is not at the same location for every batch. When you've got your data aligned, those events, like emptying the batch or ramping the temperature up, they all coincide and the plot visually looks a whole lot cleaner, okay? So when we try to go from this state, from unaligned data to aligned data, that's what we're trying to do in the computer. It's a very manual step of trying to stretch and shrink the batches to get them to appear this sort of uniform way. And the reason why we want this uniformity uh, is going to come up uh, towards the end of this class. We'll, we'll clearly see why we, we aim for that. Okay, any questions up to this point? So that's just an intro on batch data and the structure of it. So what we're going to look at now is where we're, where we're headed. What value can we extract from this data? There's a tremendous value in these batch data. Uh, in today's class, we're going to focus primarily on these first two, uh, though we will see a bit of uh, number four. So we're going to learn about these batch systems. What can we learn more about our process? At least, maybe if you're working in a company that's got these batch systems and you know the system, at least you'll confirm what you already know. But hopefully you learn something a bit more that you might want to see. We'll look mainly in this class there at troubleshooting. How do you diagnose a problem with the batch and how we can maybe make changes to fix it? And the reason why I focus so much on these two topics is because 99, 95% of every batch applications, oh sorry, all batch applications end up just with those two. Very few batch applications go to the online prediction systems or real-time monitoring systems. We'll cover that in the next class, particularly monitoring. Uh, we'll see a bit of prediction in today's class, but most batch data end up just being those two topics, and so it's important that we understand how to do that well. We'll look at this topic of optimizing and improving trajectories in the final class. Uh, so two weeks from now, we'll get to that point. So before we get to batch data analysis using latent variable methods, we sometimes want to get a really quick answer or a quick understanding of our data set without doing alignment, okay? Or without even going through the whole batch procedure. So many times we just want to get a shortcut to get to, to a, rough and, a rough answer of what we might get from latent variable methods. And that's this principle of feature extraction. In my company, I know we do this all the time because aligning our data is sometimes really hard and intensive and other pharmaceutical companies I've worked with, I know that this is the preferred approach because it's, it's quick, it's easy, and anyone can actually do it. Uh, you can do it just in ordinary Excel or MATLAB. Uh, so very little additional work is needed. And in fact, you don't need to align your data for this approach. Okay, so that's a bonus because alignment is sometimes a little tricky. So what feature extraction looks at is taking our data, 
where we've got these underlying batches. And we're going to convert every one of these horizontal slices or matrices. We're going to convert them to a single row vector of features. And we're going to extract various parameters out of that slice and extract features. So here's a typical example of three tags where we've got these unaligned data. We're going to basically work on each line one at a time for every batch and extract various parameters that quantify that line. Okay. We've seen this principle before, right? Of, uh, when we looked at steel surface appearance, we extracted wavelength features. When you, I, I briefly showed you the, the knee uh, application where Francois used the acoustic measurements coming from your knee as you swing it, and he in fact took the time series of those acoustic data and extracted wavelength coefficients from them as well. Hong Lu extracted various color-based features from the flame images to predict the energy content of the flame. Okay, so we've, we've seen many cases where we're taking complicated data sets, 3D data sets, in uh, the steel surface and the flame images, and we convert them over to a vector. In this case, we're going to do exactly the same. For every batch, we're going to create a new row, a new matrix X, called the feature matrix, and the columns in this matrix X are going to be the features we extract. And in the case where we've got a Y variable of quality values from our lab, or some final uh, variables that characterize our batch, we'll also have that Y matrix. And then we just do ordinary PLS relating the features in X to the variables in Y. So what we do is within the whole batch or within the within each phase of the batch, so if you've got a multi-phase system, it makes sense to go do this phase by phase by phase. But if you've just got a single batch, you can do it over the whole, uh, whole uh, data set. And for every one of our tags, or some of them or all of them, you're going to extract various features that you believe will quantify the behavior of that, of that tag. So often, the most useful is just to calculate the average value of that variable within the phase. So if I come back here to this example, uh, so phase one, let's take uh, this one over here. For a particular batch, phase one is the period of time where it's, it's horizontal. Phase two is where it goes up, and then phase three is where it comes down. So for phase one, I would just simply calculate the average of each of these colored lines in that however long that phase one duration. So some batches, that may be 30 seconds, other batches may be slightly longer, others shorter. No matter what the time duration of that phase, I simply calculate the average value during that time period for this particular tag. For this particular tag, I may extract a different feature. Okay? I may not be so interested in the average, but I might be much more interested in the standard deviation because the standard deviation will quantify for me how well I was able to control to around the, the mean level. Okay? And in this particular uh, trajectory, the collector tank level, I'm not interested in the mean, obviously, because it's ramping up from zero up to some final end point. And the time duration over which it does that varies, obviously, for every one of the batches. So the mean is not too informative in this case, What's much more informative in this case is the slope. Okay? The rate at which I fill that tank up. Okay? And the time over which I do that. So there's two features I would extract from this particular tank. So it's, there's no correct set of features to extract. Um, so what we often find is that people just go and they brute force extract all these features or many of these features for every tag in every phase. So we calculate the average, the median, the standard deviation, the area under the tag, slope, um, and all sorts of other features that quantify the shape or the movement of that variable over time. If you've got prior knowledge that certain things would be important, like the energy balance calculation corresponds to the heat released, then you can go calculate how much the, the cooling, how much heat has been taken up by the cooling water and integrate that and calculate that and add that as a feature variable. You might want to just simply pick the value of the trajectory at the start or the end 
and obviously the total time within that phase is, is, is very important. Okay, so brute force go and extract those features and simply create one row for that entire batch that, that, that holds all those features. Okay. And then what you go do is simply do a PCA on that. If it's just, a, if it's just an X matrix or if you've got Y variables, you'll do a PLS. Okay. In many cases, you get 80 to 100 columns of features extracted. <coughs> And not all of those are useful, especially if you've done it in a brute force way. You find a lot of them are just really noisy and uninformative. But then we do a PCA on that, or a PLS, and we use all the usual tools, VIPs, loadings, weights, contributions, and we'll do an example now interactively in the, in the next session. Okay. And what we do with that is we're, we're trying to learn about the batch. For example, is high standard deviation in one of my variables related to poor quality at the output. If I see that the high standard deviation of, say, cooling water in my loadings plot, or my weights plot, if it's P, uh, PLS, maybe over here I get the weight, so this is my W star C plot, WC star C2, and this is W star C1. My y variables c value and my x variables w star value, in this case the standard deviation, are close together in the loadings plot. That tells me that those two variables are correlated. And so I would learn then that I need to probably better control my cooling water temperature if I want to improve the quality of my uh, of this particular output, whatever the CQA or, or y variable is. So we'll spend spend quite a bit of time looking at the loadings plot in these feature extractions to try and better understand how our, how batch correlates with the quality of the product we're producing in the batch. If we've got one or two or several bad batches, we can go look at contribution plots for those and figure out why those batches went, went wrong. Hopefully one of the features we calculated will quantify for us what went wrong for that batch. Okay, so uh, I'll introduce this example and then uh, we'll, we'll, start, we'll take a look at it. This, uh, this is the data set we'll use in today's class. We'll also come back into it, uh, come back to it in the next class. And what happens here is we, it's, a, it's a drying system for an agricultural chemical. So material is, is, is added to the reactor, it's turned on, and um, this impeller, or the agitator here, we're measuring the power, the torque, and the speed of that. We're measuring the pressure in the dryer. There's a vent here at the top that, that collects the solvent that comes off and that gets collected here in the tank. We're measuring the differential pressure between the vessel, our reaction vessel, and that exit there from the collector. There's a jacket to the reactor that's providing heating and cooling, and that we're measuring the temperature set point as well as the temperature for it. And uh, I don't think we're measuring the exit temperature just the set point and the actual jacket temperature. So I presume the jacket's well mixed. And then the temperature inside the, the vessel itself, the dryer reactor. So those are our 10 tags that we're measuring. And here's some of the features that were extracted from it. So the collector tank level is the solid line over here. So we're measured, we've got that, but uh, the features that we extracted related to it are over here. So if we collect a tank, we're just measuring the mean level in phase three. Okay, so for that particular variable, all we, all we actually calculated was the mean left value in phase three. The reason why, I should actually back up here, there's a little bit extra that took, took place. When I did this work originally uh, for the paper that I asked you to read for the class today, I took these 10 tags and I did a brute force extraction of all the features. I did a PCA and a PLS on it, and then we pruned out a whole lot of the uninformative variables. So the actual variables that we ended up using in the, in the publication are just these shown in the table. So far more features were extracted, but the only ones we're gonna talk about in today's class are these, these others over here. So in that particular case, the collector, I definitely did extract that slope and the mean value in phase two and the mean value in phase three, but the only one of those 
features that were finally useful at the end was the mean value in phase three. Uh, some of the other features we calculated are this duration of time one, time two, time three, and then notice here that time four is slightly shorter than time two in the second stage. So there's the trigger point where this impeller speed or the agitator speed suddenly drops off uh, prior to the end of stage two. We calculated the slope of this particular temperature ramp. We used the final point achieved at the end of phase two before it drops off. So that peak point was used. So those are the 13 features extracted. Okay. We also had eight quality variables measured that quantified how this batch performed. So that after the batch is finished, it's the material is discharged, sent to the lab, and there's eight quality variables that this agricultural uh, chemical uh, company categorizes their material by. So what I'm going to have you do, I, okay, see if you, quite a few of you don't have your laptops here, but uh, we're going to break here now, and then while the break is progressing, you can get started on this, and then we'll take it up after the break. We're going to build a PLS model that build, uh, relates those 13 features to the Y variables. Okay. We did have an additional group of variables which we call Zs. I'll talk about those in the next class. When you import them in, in the data in the software today, you'll actually see a whole lot of columns with Z1, Z2, Z3, I think up to Z10 or 11. Simply exclude those columns. So only build a model that relates those 13 features in X up to your eight Y variables. And then try to answer these questions. So in the data set there, there's several on specification and off specification batches. Those off spec batches are found by doing a PCA on just the Ys. Just do a PCA on the Y data and the outliers in that model were the bad batches or the off specification batches. But it's quite interesting to see how the on specification and off specification batches separate. And then Try to explain why they do that by uh, using the contribution plot and also using the W star C plot. Okay. Then I want you to tell me by the end of, the, of that class what you would tell the operators to do differently. How should they you manipulate their trajectories to better run those batches? In other words, how should you operate your batch to get an on specification batch versus how you run your batch to get an off specification batch? In other words, what can they improve in their system to avoid all specification batch. Okay. So take a break. Oh, yeah, sorry, question. Why do we need to have the Y variable? Like, why don't we have like PCI and X matrix and then we can see the Austrian answer? Uh, the, in the X matrix, or you put it this way, we in the X matrix is just how you ran the batch. We don't necessarily know what's on spec and off spec there. But what you will see is that when you, you run the off spec batches differently to the on spec batches, that will show up strongly in the PLS. But when you do the PCA, you remember that designation of on spec and off spec, we don't necessarily know it at that when just from the X data. That comes from the Y data. Okay, but we're gonna we're gonna show you like the outliers from the from the equation itself, like if there is one of the equations that can be too random or like one. Yeah, if you, you, you certainly can do that, but you don't find that uh, you don't find like two clusters, or you don't find a cluster named one or two outliers. In this particular case, there's about I think it's about two thirds on spec, one third off spec. So you do get some separation between the two clusters. It's, it's basically it is like a classification problem. Right? We could treat it that way as well. Um, but in this case, our y variable isn't just a yes no or zero one. Uh, in this case, our, our y space is are these eight wise, so it's a more multivariate problem than that. So take a break for...